Shirley Ricks, thank you for joining us today. You have an illustrious career of editing, uh, first off with Farms, the Foundation for Ancient Research and Mormon Studies, and then later for the Maxwell Institute, and now you edit for the Religious Studies Center at BYU. Uh, so, a long career of editing, and as part of that, you were involved with editing Hugh Nibley in a lot of ways. Yes. So, um, with this volume, Hugh Nibley Observed, in what ways were you involved in preparing this book for publication? So, I did editing, I did proofreading, I helped with the indexing, and there were all sorts of roles that each of us took on, but I was um, involved in a lot of that. Uh, how did you get involved with editing the collected works of Hugh Nibley? I was eventually pulled in to help do source checking. I was good at running around up and down stairs in the library and, you know, helping to find sources and so forth. And so I would say about halfway through the collected works of Hugh Nibley, then I started working on the production end of the collected works. Now, for a younger generation who exists well after the time, or for a generation unfamiliar with what it would be like to edit and typeset things before modern word processing in the internet, what are some of the skills that are required for this big endeavor? Willing people, willing bodies who were willing to spend time in the library going from shelf to shelf, pulling off books, looking up sources and saying, well, is it on this page? Is it in this volume and this issue and so forth and finding it. And so not only did we use course the BYU library, but many of the sources that Nibley had gone to belonged to other libraries. So Stephen and I enjoyed traveling to libraries wow. <laughs> and checking out sources in northern and southern California, in Chicago. There were these huge Egyptological books that would not fit on a copy machine. So I would take pictures of the pages, the relevant pages. If we found the book that Nibley had used, we felt very fortunate. We said, ah, this is the book he used. And the way we could identify that was were his pencil marks. Oh, wow. Because he would write in library books, which, of course, we <laughs> cannot do these days. But we'd say, oh, yes, Nibley was here. This is the book. This is the source he was citing. It's and almost like an archaeologist <laughs> looking for the clues of yes. uh, antiquity. They were all just wonderful helpers. And we had a, a group that we called the Collected Workers of Hugh Nibley. We wore <laughs> T-shirts. Oh, wow. <laughs> we had a good time. <laughs> it's charming. And, you know, some of us with the hubris of youth uh, sometimes think, oh, things are so much easier and better now with word processing and with InDesign and all these tools. But, uh, you know, you mentioned traveling to all these libraries because there's no other way to do it. That certainly sounds better to me. I mean, that's what a nice perk. We did enjoy that. I would say it was difficult at times to um, edit some of his material in particular if it was from a speech, an oral presentation, because he would flit from topic to topic and there were probably no prepared footnotes for his <laughs> remarks. So we were in the position of having to try to manufacture and find, well, where did this come from? You know, oh, wow. so you had to create we had to, the sources. We had to create them. the sources. He might have said so-and-so, you know, given a name of an individual. So we had that heads up. Yeah. <laughs> so those were harder to edit, but if he had written something, his prose was so elegant and beautiful and styled, we really didn't have to do a lot with his, his prose, his language. It was the speeches that were a little more challenging. What do you think of his footnotes? Were, was it a nightmare to verify his sources? Did he make stuff up out of whole cloth, or was he generally reliable? It's an excellent question and one that's been bandied about, but I can say from my experience and those who have worked on this project, that he did not make up things. We remember he didn't have copy machines. He didn't have the internet. He was doing this on three by five cards. It's remarkable. And so the fact that he even had the information and then probably had it in his head as well was totally amazing. And we were always in awe at his mind and his memory and his ability to bring it all together. I have been blessed to know of his intellect, but the bottom line is it's his testimony. His testimony of the gospel shines through. He quit writing for the scholarly journals because that was too easy to publish <laughs> in them. He wanted to do something that would stand when he went to return to God and say, I've done something worthwhile. So he quit writing the scholarly articles for them and wrote things that were meaningful to the members of the church. and. 
I trust that they, the members of the church will realize what a treasure they have. Well, thank you so much for sharing your experiences and memories uh, working with Hugh Nibley. This has been wonderful. It's great to hear perspective from an editor instead of just a scholar. Yes, well, thank you. I appreciate being able to be here. Wonderful.